So I feel like this is going to be slightly anticlimactic based on the fact that I just gave that that lightning talk and got so many cheers. So uh, this is a little this is a little strange now being up here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about services. But first, uh, I just wanted to mention I work for Living Social. We are hiring senior engineers, um, and if you are interested please come see me or anyone else that works for us. We have a booth in the, the sponsor's lounge. So service-oriented architecture uh, for a lay definition is basically building your, building your overall application such that you have multiple services talking to each other to do what needs to be done. Um, if you don't know what a service is, a service is an unassociated, loosely coupled, self-contained unit of functionality. That's what I got from Wikipedia. What that basically means to me is that it is a singularly focused application by itself. It's something that you could take that application and expose it to the outside world and there would be some value just in itself. So the benefits of a service-oriented application or architecture um, are manifold. The biggest one, in my opinion, is that it can be an asynchronous. And when I say can be asynchronous, I mean that you can just fire and forget many times. If you are doing um, reporting or whatnot, you can just send off, say, I want this report and go about doing whatever you want, and later it can ping you back and say, hey, this report's done. Um, it is parallelizable, that's a fun word, um, in the sense that if the, if the uh, client that you are using to communicate with your services uh, is capable of parallel requests, you can make these requests in parallel to save time when you're actually processing the page that you're about to load. It has loose coupling, as was stated before, meaning that um, the individual applications are much easier to change because they are so far removed from the overall architecture of the, app, uh, of the other services, the other clients that rely on the service. Um, it can give you faster tests, meaning that suddenly uh, if you move from a monolithic application to a service-oriented architecture, you have numerous small uh, test suites rather than one giant test suite. So when you make a change in a service, you're only running, say, 10%, 20% of your tests rather than the full suite. And that is enough to cover the full service to know that you are actually living up to the contract that you've established. Um, as I said before, it is, some, it is significantly easier to extend and change because of the loose coupling. Um, and the thing that a lot of managers will like the best about it is it actually increases the velocity when you are working to extend, um, extend because of that reduction in coupling and the easy extensibility. Now, I've gone to a lot of service-oriented architecture talks, and I always had a problem with them because they talked about service-oriented architecture at a very high level. They basically said you need to identify what your problem areas are, and then you need to, to understand how you're going to change the database, and then make the service. And basically, any time that I tried to do that, I kind of felt like this. <laughs> it was always a question of how. How do I actually pull out the service? How do I actually go about breaking up the coupling that I currently have and actually make the service a distinct and separated part of the code base. So, like I said, I work for Living Social, and if I could, I would show you what our, our backend organization chart looks like, but suffice to say, it is so many different services. There are so many services just talking to each other. There's things for, for um, authentication, for, for logging in. There's things for financial work. There are things for, for handling the, the, the merchant communications. It's just 
it, there, it is a many layered uh, set of responsibilities that are distributed throughout multiple code bases. So when I was first starting there, um, we were looking to change one of our APIs from, uh, from one that was quick but slightly unreliable as far as the, the data um, to be one that is more uh, correct. It was, it was more precise in its, in its calculations. It was up to date. Um, so with the new, PA, new API came new possibilities, and one thing that we were looking to, to explore was to dog food our to dog food our API by making a client. Uh, dog fooding, if you don't understand what that means, basically is taking an API that you are making for other people and using it yourself directly. That way you are at the mercy of what you actually have allowed rather than just saying, oh, the customers can totally do that. They have all the, they, they have everything that they need. Meanwhile, you're doing things that are only applicable if you have an internal connection. So let's get started about how to actually build a service. The first step in building a service is determining what your service will do. Now this is something that, that takes a little bit of time because people have all of these ideas about like, oh, we have this whole piece that feels like it should be going to, should be, should be linked together and should be, uh, it, should, it shouldn't be a malleable piece of, of code, so it's, it's one unit. That being said, services should do one thing well. One, I, I personally have never gone to mom and pop's uh, car repair and washing machine uh, dispensary, so it's kind of something that bears repeating. Again, services should do one thing well. If you're doing authentication, it should just do authentication. It shouldn't do authentication and personnel management. It shouldn't do, um, it shouldn't do account creation and financial management. It should be doing one thing, and it should do that one thing well. After you determine what your service is actually going to be doing, you need to create endpoints for the services. Um, so you need to ask yourself, what are the endpoints of the service? What actions are available to somebody using this? Are, is it just um, authentication, meaning are you doing a post that then returns a response? Are you doing, um, are you allowing for lists of, uh, in our case, deals? Um, we had, like, the, the API that we were working on uh, was for getting information about deals, and we could do individual deals, uh, we could do uh, an index of deals, we could create deals uh, or payments, and, um, yeah, modify deals or payments. Um, so, after you determine what the endpoints of your service are, you have to go about and build the controllers. Building the controllers is a fairly easy step. We've all gone through and made controllers and rails. Um, there's nothing really special here. Um, then you need to determine what your request options are. Basically, um, is there an ability to filter a response? If you're returning some odd 30 attributes for an object, are you going to allow people to say, I only want these five attributes. Or maybe um, you can say, um, I don't need these three attributes. Uh, using Rails, the to JSON method allows for only an accept options. Are you building these things into your API so that people can use that to customize what they're getting back? Um, you also need to ask yourself, um, are we having multiple objects per request? Uh, like I said, our particular one allows us to get payment information for deals, uh, and the, we have the ability to request multiple deals per request. Um, so we can get 
uh, say, 10 or 20 deals in a single request rather than having to get them one at a time. Um, one problem that we kind of, that we ran into when we were making our API was we had a lot of attributes that we didn't actually want to send off to the users. So the problem with this is when you have a default that says, that says okay, we only want to return these 15 attributes out of the 50 that we have on our, on our deal or on our deals payments. If somebody then comes in and says, I don't want these particular ones, it might override those defaults and expose something that you weren't expecting. Um, to get around that, we actually ended up using active model serializers. The link is there, you can go and check them out. Um, but what active model serializers are is a way to overwrite or override the to JSON method in controllers so that you can just have the standard to JSON or um, JSON parsing or not parsing um, serialization and it will only give back what you specify. And what this looks like is something very simple. It's just a list of attributes um, and then a list of potential um, associations that you also want to serialize and the serializers for those associations. Now with this you can also go through and say for um, state if we wanted to, we could define a method on this serializer and it would actually override the default behavior. So you can change, you have a lot of customizability in what you're actually serializing for the consumers of your, your API. One really, really important step for this in particular is write tests. Seriously, write tests. What the tests are in this particular, in, in, when you're doing a service, is it is a contract about what your service fulfills. It basically says, I am providing this, and if, it, if your tests ever fail, you have broken that contract. So hopefully you're using some type of CI to do uh, continuous uh, integration and deployment so that you never break that contract with your, uh, with your services consumers. The next step is to create client models. It's sometimes tempting to just use the, str just use the response that comes out from a particular service. Don't do that, seriously. Do not do that, it is a terrible, terrible idea. I've worked somewhere where we were basically working directly with hashes in a client application and it was a nightmare. Basically, every single, if, if, any, if anything changed so that one attribute that was previously nested under the, the address then move suddenly and it is now under the city, um, you then have to go and fish in through all of your code to figure out where that, where that change is necessary to, to make. So with many things, if you're using a third party application or a third party library or gem or whatever, wrapping a response is good. Um, that being said, when you're first developing your API, it's sometimes really, difficult to, to anticipate what you're going to need. Um, and so when I was doing this API, I actually created something that I termed really dark magic. It's terrible. This is what it looks like. Uh, what that is, um, is, a, is something that goes through and for every hash that is in the, the initial hash that's passed in, it will check to see if there is a class defined in the client model's namespace and try to create one of that, of that class. Um, and if there is an array, it will try to create many of that object. Uh, and if it doesn't, it fails, it gets an exception silently and then just sets it as an instance, var instance variable instead of as a, as a class. Um, this is horribly non-performant and it's incredibly mutable to the point where there's no structure to it at all. So really, please don't do that. 
um, the, the client models often just ended up looking like this because I just wanted the, the, the creation of the model. That being said, it did allow me to then potentially overwrite certain things in my client so that I could, could make some, some quick adjustments and that this would over time shape itself into what the, what the actual structure of what we were creating wanted to be. And again, this is a caution. It's great for rapid prototyping, and it's horrible for everything else. So you really shouldn't be doing that, until, like, or you can do it. Just don't release with that. <laughs> um, again, write tests for, for your client in this case. Um, writing tests for the client on the other side of the on the other side of the service is basically a guarantee that the service hasn't changed. Um, so that when you do eventually update the client, or update the service rather, um, those tests will break and it will say, hey, you actually need to update this before you push it out for, to production. Um, so there is a gem that uh, kind of encapsulates both step two and three of creating the, the controllers, uh, they're the responses, and creating the client models that are being consumed. And that is uh, a gem called Sanjay. Uh, thank you to Steve Jorgensen for showing me this. Um, it is very similar to the active model serializers in that when you're creating an object model, you basically just give a list of properties that you want to encode um, and that will uh, basically create a, a parser that can take JSON and turn it into one of these objects so that when you get JSON back from your service, you just run the, the model parser and it will create an instance of that object for you. The next step in creating a service is to create the communication layer. How does... Um, how does your client or how does any of your clients communicate with this service? Um, find a gem, any gem really. Uh, you can just use like the standard HTTP library. You can use um, the various REST gems that exist. My recommendation personally is for a gem called Typus. And the reason why I recommend that is because it allows for concurrent uh, or to for parallel requests to be made. You can queue up a number of requests to uh, an API um, or to many APIs, and then you can have them run all at the same time, and they will get back to you and run a callback after they get the response. And so that allows you to, um, to basically save quite a bit of time because of the, the reduction in uh, round trip times to communicate with the, the application or the service that you're dealing with. Um, again, it's, this, uh, this then allows concurrent requests. Um, it also will condense the, the time it takes to get each one of those individual requests. Um, again, when dealing with any type of library or gem, wrap it. Wrap it, seriously. It's, it's a terrible thing to, to use a gem and to not take the time to wrap it so that it's condensed into one particular part of your application. Um, everybody, well, not everybody, but many people remember going from Active Record 2.3 to 3. whatever. It was a headache. It was a nightmare to go from 2.3 to 3.x because of the fact that Everything changed, and you had to find every single instance where you were using this, where you were using Active Record, and potentially change it. I mean, if you want to hear nightmares about it right now, you can talk to Carrie. She's dealing with that right now. <laughs> so, after you after you create the communication layer, there is a bonus step that you can do for people that that are going to be com um, consuming your service, um, because if you take client models and you add a communication layer, that basically can be wrapped up into a gem. A uh, gem. <laughs> the, last, uh, the, the next step is to sever depend dependencies. Basically, just go through and replace any database calls in your current 
you're in, in your existing client or service, uh, and you're basically going to, to segregate that and create a gap, you're also going to have to mine the gap. Um, the other thing that is, uh, is important to note is that after you, after you create this gap in the, um, between your service that you're creating and the, the client that's consuming it, you're still in the same code base. So if you want to start testing this, you're going to need a multi-request server of some sort. When I was doing this, there was a period of about two to three hours or more that I spent getting timeout request after timeout request, and I was trying to figure out desperately while working with a coworker, and then couldn't figure it out for the life of us. And suddenly we realized that we had run into a web brick wall. WebRick being a, a server that only allows one request would be working on the initial request and wouldn't be able to process the call to the same server to get the information from the API and so would be waiting on the, the, on the request from the service in the main request while, the, main, while the, the service request was waiting behind that in the queue. And so eventually, they'd both time out. The next thing that you need to do is improve the service's performance. A round trip over a network is nowhere near as fast as a database call. So the way that I go about doing this is with a series of tools. I was actually unaware of StackProf, which basically uh, is the new version of um, of the tool that I use, which is specifically for Ruby 2.1. So thank you, Aaron Patterson, for showing, me, showing us that yesterday. Um, like I said, I use, uh, I use personally perf tools because we don't run shiny new 2.1, um, and I assume most of you do not. Perf tools will give you a display like this. It's a lot of information to take in. It's terrifying. Um, I, like when I first started using it, I was really confused by this. There's a whole bunch of numbers. The ones on the, on the left side um, are effectively useless to me. They are, they are where uh, and how long the, the named method is, uh, how long it, or how many times it shows up uh, in the profiles. However, the two columns directly to the left of the, the method names are the ones that I use most often. What those are is a, um, are the number of profile samples that the method listed and any of its descendant calls actually show up in the profile. So basically it's any time it shows up in the call stack at all. Um, the reason why this is very useful is because um, you, can, you can get, get a, uh, an idea of where you should be drilling down into your application. Um, the one thing I will note in this is the 64.3% garbage collector, which is terrifying, um, but it's important for the next, the next step of what I'm showing. Um, the next step is basically finding where you're entering your application. Uh, for this particular case, I was using Active Model Serializer to JSON, which is line 267. And if you look there, it's 35.7%. So that is everything that is not the garbage collector. So you're dealing with 35.7% of your time being spent in that method or any of its descendants. Drilling down a little bit further, this particular perf, uh, profiling uh, gets to the, uh, the deal serializer, which as I drill down into that, the, the attributes creating the, that list, the list of attributes for the serializer took 8% of the time, with 5.9% of the time being spent in the gross sales method. And then following that down a little bit further, um, I, eventually got, I would eventually get to the main bottleneck. And you can find this pretty quickly as you're going through your, your, your list of, of methods, seeing like, oh, gross sales calls this other thing, which then calls um, something else, and then that part 
can usually be a glaring incidence of where you're spending most of your time. In this case, the calculator's coupons method, taking 21.5% of my time, is where I was focusing all of my time on trying to optimize, because it was where I was spending all of my time. Um, I forget who it was that was saying that they, they thought, oh, I usually have a good idea about where, where my problem is, and then would try it and would get very little back. Um, that used to be me until I started and really learned how to use this tool. Now, any time that I'm dealing with any type of performance improvement, I just use this tool immediately because I am almost universally wrong about what, what it should be. Um, there was a time when we made an adjustment to a time method. Um, like literally we weren't memoizing a start time and end time. And that dropped our, like making that adjustment dropped a, a call from six seconds to three. It was something incredibly minute. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed it. So get to know perf tools or, um, or the other one, which I forget right now, StackProf. Um, those tools, as far as uh, profiling your application and really understanding where you're spending your time are invaluable for saving man hours. The last step is to then transfer the client and or the service. Basically, this has all been done inside of one application, and now it is time, after creating that gap, to then pull it apart and separate them into two, into two separate um, code bases. So you, extract the, so you extract from the original code base and create two different ones. Oftentimes, this, inv this can involve extracting, extracting tables or databases from existing, one, existing situations and moving them to another, uh, to another uh, server. Then, if you're dealing with the databases, you then have to figure out how to keep multiple databases in sync. Please figure that out. I really have no clue how to do that part. And if you do know, please give a talk on that maybe? Thanks? And that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs>